This is the original patent drawing submitted in 1920 for one of the most well-known toys in the world, the pogo stick. The critical component, of course, is the compressible spring that allows the user to launch themselves sky high. We've had several questions surrounding the modeling process for compressible springs in SOLIDWORKS from the Solid Professor community, and we'll be addressing them using this antique replica in this episode of Ask Solid Professor. Here, just no, think not like you're Try turning it off and back it. on again. Here, try this. No, oh, yes, there we go. That wasn't too bad. Let's start with a quick disclaimer. This is not a video for brand new SOLIDWORKS users. We'll be covering a number of intermediate and advanced concepts, including advanced sweeps, as well as in-context assembly modeling. So if you're looking to learn the very basics, we'd recommend starting with our Introduction to SOLIDWORKS course, which you can find in the course library. Now, like just about everything else in SOLIDWORKS, there's a lot of different ways to build a spring, and one of the most commonly shown methods is with a helical curve. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this approach, except that in this case, it's not going to be dynamically compressible, which is our goal here. There's a few reasons that this is the case, but the primary reason is because a helical path is actually a curve feature with dimensions that are difficult to access and change. And using this curve feature to then create a sweep to then generate the spring makes things even more complicated as the two features are now tied together. And while we can technically force the setup to be compressible, it's prone to errors and generally not recommended. And there's also a much easier approach than this. First, let's take a quick measurement between the spring stops on the pogo stick. This comes out to about 696 millimeters and it'll be the initial length of our spring. We'll start a new part, begin a new simple sketch on the front plane and create a vertical line coincident to the origin. I'll then dimension that to 696 and that's all we need for this sketch. So I'll start another new one, this time once again on the front plane. Here we'll sketch out a construction line that'll represent the outside radius of the spring, in this case 26 millimeters, and then a circle centered on the construction line and coincident to the end point with a diameter equal to the spring coil material thickness, or 6 millimeters in this case. Positioning the circle as shown will ensure that the outer diameter of the spring is not too large. Now to create the spring, we'll use a sweep feature, but if you've used a sweep feature before, you may find this to be an odd setup because typically sweeps are used at the profile that is perpendicular to a path, sweeping through the volume to be created. But how could that possibly work with our profile in this orientation? The key lies in the twist that we are going to force into the sweep. So let's see how that works. Using the sketch profile option, select the circle as the profile. And keep in mind that you can't simply use the circular profile option as that will automate a circular profile perpendicular to the path, preventing us from using any twist, which we need for this technique. Then click the vertical line for the path selection, and there will be no preview visible, and this is to be expected because the current setup wouldn't actually sweep through any volume. Now click the options drop down where you'll find an option for profile twist currently set to none. We're going to change this to specify twist value so we can decide how many coils our spring should have. You can specify this value using whatever units you'd like, but revolutions likely makes the most sense for our spring design. Then type a value into the direction one box to see what the spring will look like with that number of revolutions. Now, remember, we're designing the spring in its unloaded state, so the coils will move closer together during compression and further apart during tension. Keep this in mind as you choose how many coils to create. I've gone with a value of 30 just for this example. To avoid issues with interference in the assembly for this demonstration, I'm going to cut off a bit of excess material at the top and the bottom of the spring that exceeds the path length. There's a number of ways to do this, but I'm going to keep it simple and just use the top plane with a cut with surface command to trim the bottom. You can either search for this command like I'm doing here, or you can find it in the surfaces tab of the command manager. Select the top plane and ensure the on-screen arrow is pointing down using the reverse button if necessary, and then click OK to trim off a bit of material. The process for trimming the top is a bit more involved because we'll need an offset plane that always matches the length dimension of our spring but it's really not too tricky. First, make sure the sketch with the vertical line is showing, then start a new plane. For the first reference, select the top plane and then the upper end point of the vertical line for the second reference. This will create a plane that exists parallel to the top plane at the very end of the path, regardless of if the path length changes. Now you can repeat this process using cut with surface once again and the new plane to remove the excess material at the top. All right, let's see the magic actually happen. Expand the sweep feature, click the sketch containing the vertical sketch line representing the spring length, and the dimension should appear on screen with a dark blue handle available. 
If you don't see this handle, make sure that the Instant 3D function is turned on in the Features tab of the Command Manager. Click and drag that blue handle to adjust the length value on the fly, and you should see the spring compress and expand. I'm going to keep this value a bit smaller than the original 690 millimeters to th make things a bit easier as we prepare to add the spring to our pogo stick assembly. Now I'll start by using insert component to bring the spring into the assembly and then I'll expand the feature tree of the spring. Here we'll expand the sweep feature then right click the sketch containing the vertical line path. I'm going to use the show command here to make it easier to mate this up and once that's visible I'll use it to create a concentric mate with the center post and we'll also uh, lock the rotation of this mate. Then we'll use the top and bottom points of the same vertical line to make coincident to the planar faces of their respective spring stops. It's important to use the sketch geometry of the spring to mate here and not the faces of the spring, and we'll be explaining why in just a few moments here. Now this is where things get a little tricky. Our spring length is currently controlled by dimension, which was originally 690 millimeters until I shortened it. If I mate this assembly up as is, that dimension will continue to act as a constraint, and I'll only be able to change the spring length by manipulating that dimension directly, so the body of the pogo stick essentially just snaps to the spring length. What I really want to be able to do is drag the pogo stick up and down, and see the spring compress and expand, essentially making the spring dependent on the pogo stick, not vice versa. So what do we do? Well, the spring length dimension has to go, so let's get rid of that now. Going back to the spring model, I'll simply edit the vertical line sketch and remove the dimension. Now let's see what happens back in the assembly. Nothing. But why? Well, remember that assembly components are treated as rigid within the assembly even if they contain underdefined sketches or features. While we can still edit the component within the assembly and change the spring size by dragging the sketch, we can't change the spring length by dragging the surrounding components, unless we use in-context modeling. In-context modeling allows us to define not only the length of the spring, but also where it begins and ends, all using references from within the assembly. To accomplish this, we'll need to right-click the spring component and use the edit part command. At this point, you should see some visible change in the user interface, along with blue text in the feature manager. This means you're in the right place. Now we'll edit the sketch associated with the vertical line and attach the upper endpoint to the planar face of the spring stop component. Keep in mind that if we still had a length dimension associated with this line, it would conflict with this process. We could delete the existing mate to the sketch origin and follow the same process for the lower portion of the spring as well, but that's not necessary here because of the existing assembly mates. So that should do it. Our spring component now refers to the assembly, specifically the position of the upper spring stop to determine how long the vertical line should be and therefore the length of the spring. Let's see how it works. I'll exit the sketch and I'll exit component editing mode as well and give the pogo stick body a drag and still nothing. The last thing to note here is that if a component is fully defined by mates in an assembly, it won't be able to move even if its features are modeled in context like we've done here. Essentially anything that's supposed to move needs to be underdefined and the coincident mate we created earlier between the spring sketch and the upper spring stop is preventing this movement. Suppressing or deleting this mate makes the movement we were hoping for possible, and with a quick drag and a rebuild, we can see our spring adjust in length. That's all there is to it. Though rebuilds are required between movements to see the spring length update in the context of an assembly like we have here, it's also possible to create a realistic animation of this behavior using a motion study. If you're interested in learning more about the possibilities of in-context assembly modeling, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more tips and tricks, and check out our course on SOLIDWORKS Advanced Assembly Design on the Solid Professor website. This course covers critical concepts and best practices on assembly structure, advanced mates, top-down assembly design, and a whole lot more. Thanks for tuning in, and see you in the next episode of Ask Solid Professor.